moderators you see here today are interns from the Office of Sustainability. As facilitators of this conversation, we recognize our role as a predominantly white space in an academic setting and understand that our organization of this event has been influenced by our experiences as students, interns, environmentalists, and members of our respective races, ethnicities, and socioeconomic statuses. Even though we're all spread out now, we'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement for where this is being hosted from, the Yukon Stores campus. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pawgusset, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. Awesome, thank you so much, Natalie. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin. I'm another intern at the Office of Sustainability. Um, I wanna speak a little bit about our panel and what brings us here. So as we witness rapid changes in the Earth's balance, we recognize the need for comprehensive responses to the environmental issues challenging our generation. And when discussing the environmental movement, a common misconception is that conserving and healing our planet comes at the expense of jobs. And however, this dichotomy ignores the intersectional multi <laughs> multidisciplinary nature of climate change solutions, as we all know. Um, especially the professionals in the room. Um, so we need to approach these conversations through a lens that addresses our positionality, um, as well as economic, political, social, cultural, and technological effects. So clearly, you know, environment, we have everything. So um, when taking this into consideration, a career in conservation and sustainability can lead us down so many different paths, some of which we'll learn about today. Only a few, but <laughs> we try to cover our bases. Um, so today we have some great panelists you can see to speak on their experiences as leaders and professionals in the environmental field. Uh, their goal as well as ours is to provide you with career advice and just some starting points to explore where your career might be headed um, and you know wherever it leads you in the environmental field. Uh, well, so we'll have our panelists introduce themselves first and then we'll move on to some questions and end with a Q&A session as well as uh, an optional networking panel after and we'll give more information when we get there. Uh, if you have any questions uh, to the attendees during this, uh, feel free to um, message me, Caitlin Zadona, um, and I will look through them. And then um, please, uh, when you note your questions, note whether you'd like to speak them out uh, as we can unmute you, or if you'd like me to speak on behalf. Okay, cool. So with that, we'll start with some introductions. Um, enough of us talking. <laughs> so uh, panelists, if you'd like to give your name, uh, pronouns. Uh, so, for example, mine would be she, her, hers, and what you do as work and how it relates to the environment. So, I'll, I'll give, <laughs> I'll start us off. So, the order, um, if you could start with Rose Krug, that'd be lovely. Yeah. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Perfect. Um, so, my name is Rose Krug. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And uh, I just want to start off with saying that I am a UConn alum. I went to undergrad and grad school, and I am um, so incredibly proud to see the Office of Sustainability putting this event on. Um, I, I used to work there back when it was called the Environmental Policy Office. Um, but for now, um, I work for the state. I work for the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. I am an associate research analyst. Um, and I work primarily on our lead by example program, um, which is essentially just our our state government sustainability initiative. But uh, I work on other topics as well in our office. So um, I'll stop there. I'm sure others have a lot to say. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. OK, now we're going to go to Tahira. Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Tahira Abdul Mateen, and I uh, my pronouns she, her, hers. And I am an environmental engineer. I work for AECOM, which I think is, if not the top within the top three uh, engineering consulting firms in the world. And um, right now, uh, my role changes almost daily. Um, but I do some people management. I do some. Uh, business development and strategy consultants. I do engineering remediation. Uh, my background is in remediation, um, but it's definitely morphed into a lot of different things over the past 13 or 14 years I've been in the industry. So. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Um, okay, so now we'll go to Lee. Oh, 
Um, Lee, you might be muted. <laughs> There we go. Got it. There you go. Cool. Awesome. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, my first experience with WebEx, though. Um, my name is Lee Cruz, uh, pronouns he, him, his. I am the Director of Community Outreach at the Community Foundation for Greater New Haven. We are the log largest philanthropic entity in Greater New Haven. We um, get donations from individuals and families, invest those donations, and then send them out as grants to uh, nonprofits. Uh, I work with uh, nonprofits, I work with small businesses, and uh, also with civic leaders. We provide grants in a number of areas, uh, environment being just one of them, and uh, we also fund neighborhood leaders in uh, New Haven and surrounding towns. And I'll tell you more about what I do specifically later on. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Okay. Um, now we'll go to Grace. Hello, everyone. My name is Grace He, and I work as the Green Infrastructure Assistant over at the City of Hartford's Office of Sustainability. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And if you haven't heard of our office, we really are charged with implementing our Hartford Climate Action Plan, and that's intended to use environmental stewardship as a catalyst for improving uh, improving public health, increasing social equity, and supporting economic development. And we also work in various areas from landscape, water, energy, transportation, food, and waste. My own particular work as GI assistant is focused on landscape and water. We've also had the pleasure with working with UConn and various different campuses, students, faculty, staff, and we're glad to be able to, to share a little bit more about what we do. <laughs> thank you. So thank you for being here. Okay. Now we'll go to Alyssa. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elise lambo Um, My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, I currently work for the Connecticut Green Bank. We're a quasi-state organization that offers financing programs to the, the residents and, and business owners in, in the state of Connecticut. Um, I work primarily on the financing programs team. Um, we have a, a financing program that's available to commercial property owners. So that's what I, I focus on in my role. I also focus a lot on um, contractor education and developer um, outreach. Um, I also am a UConn alum. I did my undergrad at UConn, uh, where I uh, graduated with my bachelor's in um, natural resources and environmental conservation. I was also a, a eco, -husky, eco husky president um, and an intern at the Office of Environmental Policy, now Sustainability as well. So really happy to, to be here. Thanks for having me join. Awesome. Thank you. I know we have so many UConn alums. <laughs> this is very exciting. <laughs> Um, okay, so next we'll go to uh, Janine. I think I might be the last. Hi, everyone. <laughs> the best for us. Happy to be here tonight. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I am with 27 years with my company, my loan and McBroom, uh, soon to be SLR. We'll talk about that later. But um, I've had the honor of spending my entire 33 year career working in rivers, lakes, tidal wetlands, the ocean. Um, I really consider myself one of the lucky ones. My career is focused mostly on rest restoring ecosystems, uh, finding solutions to avoid, minim minimize, and mitigate environmental impacts, and working hand in hand with communities to make our world more resilient to the effects of climate change. So hopefully we'll have a lot of time to chat about that in the next hour or so. Um, I am also a UConn alum, class of 1987, School of Civil Engineering. Um, I'm a lifelong resident of Connecticut. I have lived here forever with my, uh, my husband and my two recently college educated children, one at UConn and the other at UMass Amherst. I am a big believer and a proponent of public university education. I adore UConn. Um, I, am, I have the honor of serving on the board of trustees for the past three years. And um, I think your generation is fantastic. So I'm thrilled to be with you here tonight. 
Wow, thank you so much, everybody, for coming and for introducing yourselves. Um, okay, so with that, we'll get right into the conversation. <laughs> um, a few of our interns are going to be sprinkling in, uh, but we'll start off with some questions. So uh, the first question we have for you all is, um, yeah, this will be for all panelists, um, and we'll probably do the same order that I did, and I'll remind us. Um, so why did you choose to go into a career relating to the environment, and how did you get into that position that you are right now? Um, so kind of a two part. <laughs> um, we'll start actually. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll start with Rose. Um, so why did I decide to go into a career in the environment? So growing up, um, I love flowers a lot. I'll say that's how I always say it started. It started with flowers. So my mom was gardening all the time. I was always out there gardening with her. Um, I have tattoos. They're all flowers. My name is Rose. So. Um, I have just like a, and I love the outdoors. So I have like a deep love for the outdoors. And then going into college, well, I'm kind of a strategic person. So I was like, I know I want to do something with the environment, but I want to make sure that I'm going to make the biggest impact I can. So I started looking up. I was like, oh, what what makes the the worst impact on the environment? And I landed on energy. And I was like, oh boy, energy, the energy that we use, where it comes from, the quantity that we use, um, the impacts that it has on our society. Um, so I was like, that's where I'm going to go. Um, but I started as a math major because I always loved math. Um, but I got into there and they were kind of like, ooh, math is math is super serious. You, you got to really be committed to this. And I was like, I don't know if I can I can stick on the math train that hard. So um, I went to go see my advisor. I was in the ACES program, which meant maybe that still exists. Um, and she said, have you heard of agricultural and resource economics? And I was like, no, I haven't. From there it was it was a really good fit for me um so i actually i interned at a few places i interned at this company called the green bride guide where i helped them with um, search engine optimization to help their um kind of like blog and website perform better they were trying to help people have more eco-friendly weddings um and then um, the next summer i applied for a job at deep in the energy demand office and i got it and um I worked in kind of helping to benchmark state buildings and understand like what their energy usage is so that you can then compare uh, going forward what what reductions you're seeing, whether you're seeing increases. Um, and yeah, so I fast forward, I got my master's at UConn. I applied for a job at Deep. Um, it was like seemed like the perfect fit for me. Um, it was a research analyst position. And um, after a while, it took a while for them to get back to me. I actually got another job working for Eversource doing um, vegetation management, stakeholder outreach for them. But I I got the job. Um, and then what was the, the second question? Did I just answer it? <laughs> you did. So it was uh, okay. <laughs> kind of how you got to the position you are right now. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. <laughs> yeah, intern, internships are key. That's my takeaway. <laughs> Yes, for sure. Um, I'm sure a lot of students resonate with that. And thank you for sharing. And it's really cool seeing um, from a UConn kind of start <laughs> how you got to mm -hmm. work. Thank you. Okay, now we'll jump to uh, Tahira. So I'll just repeat the questions because I know I sped them really quick. So why did you choose to go into the career you did relating to the environment? And then how did you get into the position you are now? Of course. So uh, I remember being in high school, I think it was like a junior or a sophomore. And, and uh, I remember searching online and I don't remember why I was doing this, but uh, I came across a technical paper, super nerdy, um, that uh, was written by Engineers Without Borders. And uh, it's similar to Doctors Without Borders, except it's engineers. And the paper was on um testing that they were doing of a water supply in africa uh, a village in africa they one of their projects was a, a village in africa and, and they were coming up with ways to treat um harmful bacteria in, in their drinking water and it was causing health and it went into the paper went into the effects of the contaminated drinking water on the community you know what concentrations were in there you know and, and then evaluating methods to, to basically dealing with that. And uh, I thought it was super cool because I think at that time there was a lot of 
conversation in the news back in the day um, about uh, the African water crisis. Uh, and that was inspiring to me. It, 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 um, I wanted to learn how, uh, what techniques and skills would I need to help solve that problem. And um, after jumping around a bunch of different majors, I landed on environmental engineering. Um, so as a side note, uh, and we'll get into this, but jumping around majors is perfectly fine. Having tons of minors, totally okay, because you'll figure it out eventually. Um, but uh, uh, that, that's kind of what got me into it. You know, I think, um, uh, and, it, and it just about, you know, it, it went up from there. Environmental engineering deals with a bunch of different things, water, air, soil, um, all aspects of the environment. It's basically developing solutions, hands-on uh, solutions to to dealing with uh, the environment in many different ways. Um, the second part to that, right? Totally forgot that. What was that? <laughs> oh, no, it's so fun. Um, so it's how did you get into the position you are now? Okay, okay. Um, two things. I think um, so. I've I I went into consulting once I graduated, um, and then have been in consulting since for the past thirteen or fourteen years. Uh, internships are definitely key. Um, but two things that I found in particular that kind of accelerated me in my career, one of them was work ethic. Um, so regardless of whether you hate what you're doing that day or whatever, you're still performing 100%, right? Um, and and that's, that shows, I think, that, that kind of work ethic, performing 100%, um, regardless of what you're doing, will take you tons of places, right? Um, the second one was learning um, and constantly um, Constantly trying to improve your understanding of whatever you're doing, um, because it shows that you're wanting to evolve and, and you're not complacent. Um, I remember early on in my career, that was something that my supervisor told me. She said, Sahira, you really need to read. And then it like hit me. I'm like, oh my God, I need to read more. <laughs> so uh, from then on, I did, and uh, and it and it showed. It I think it um, it helps me get where I am today. So. Yeah, thank you so much. I definitely. I appreciate that. And also the comment about jumping around majors is I, and you also answered a few questions that we'll get to later. So that's perfect. You set us up. Um, so at next we'll go to Lee. Um, so let me know if you need the questions repeated. Okay, well, um, I'll, I'll start and see, see how far I get. So um, I have to admit, I, I, I grew up pretty clueless in the South Bronx in New York City back in the uh, 60s and, um, and moved from there to Puerto Rico, also still pretty clueless and on into high school here in Connecticut. Um, and then when I went to college, I spent seven weeks in Haiti um, with uh, an extended class as a part of going to, going to college and um, went early with a friend of mine who was Haitian and it really sort of opened my eyes because as early as the mid 70s, it was pretty clear that international corporations and the, the non-elected leadership of Haiti had pretty much decimated that country. And it, it struck me, but I, I wasn't ready yet. So I go back and finish college and finish graduate school and wind up actually at a job doing international development in Nicaragua. And um, the, the focus of the work is social and economic development. And again, it hits me, I, I'm working with P Dutch people, I'm working with Swedish people. They're working on everything from water filtration systems that don't count on uh, electricity to sustainable agriculture wind up doing some work on uh, on a sustainable agriculture demonstration farm and um, learning from uh, people from Yale School uh, for the Environment now, it used to be Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Services, spent quite a bit of time with people from that school. And then I came back to the United States and became involved with the Connecticut Coalition for Environmental Justice and really became focused on environmental issues. I've, I've always lived in cities. I'm a city kind of guy. And so that really kind of resonated with me and uh, it resulted in my helping to be um, one of the founders of New Haven Environmental Justice Network. Um, 
Then from there, um, I became involved with the Urban Resources Initiative at uh, Yale University School of Forestry. They help plant trees in urban settings. We've increased the tree canopy density. We're at um, twice what Hartford and Bridgeport are in terms of our tree canopy, which is good for us. And hopefully uh, Bridgeport and, and Hartford will catch up on that. And I also became involved with two other great organizations the New Haven Land Trust and New Haven Farms, they recently merged uh, to become Gather New Haven. And the work there is all about community gardens uh, for beautification, for food, for sustainability, and also for health reasons. And then most recently, I was asked to be on the Governor's Council for Climate Change. I'm co-chairing the Environmental Justice uh, Committee for that uh, council for the governor. And so in all of those things, um, what has resonated through it is sort of a growing knowledge and growing interest. Uh, and then also I was fortunate enough to about, uh, you know, in the last six to nine years, I've had two kids uh, come into my life, uh, both sons. And as I think now about the world, I see it through their eyes and the fact that they're gonna be around well into close to the end of this century. So it's it's brought all those things together for me. So although I work in funding of nonprofit organizations and also small businesses in New Haven, I do so with an eye towards sustainability and toward maintaining a healthy environment. Wow, thank you so much. Yeah, that's incredible. And also, I, we really appreciate, um, I mean, we tried to get a spectrum of different, you know, professionals and you think that you have, you know, a very community based approach, is, which is fantastic um, and certainly needed in the sustainability movement. So uh, next we'll go to Grace. I know um, for the for the panelists wondering why they're always last. We will switch up the order. <laughs> no worries in the next few questions. So and it is not personal at all. <laughs> so uh, Grace, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, and no worries. I think it all works with the last name I, like mine. I'm used to being last. <laughs> Um, so, yes, I, I work as a green infrastructure assistant over in the city of Hartford. I mentioned briefly before that our office works in a number of different areas and that my work specifically lines up in landscape and water, but we do double in other areas like food, waste, energy, and transportation. So, definitely going to get back to how I started there, um, but, uh, right, I think in terms of interest, likewise, I, I, Let's say that my, my I'm still on my path that to to learning and developing my career goals and um, but have always had somewhat of an affinity to to nature and the environment. As a kid, I wanted to be a biologist. You know, I didn't end up in that field directly, but had the you know opportunity. It's a related field in a sense. So, but I would say that even though um, I had that interest, it didn't really fully develop until I went into college, and even then. In the first two years, I waited until the very last moment to, to declare. I really took my time for the first two years to gain an interest, um, explore different genetic requirements. I think in some parts, I see myself as a jack of all trades, which isn't a bad thing per se. It actually has become very useful in my current job. We're an office of two, so we found that we've had to um, be really resourceful and do a little bit of everything. Um, while also focusing and providing services and, and information. So um, I think it definitely has some <laughs> transferable um, skills in that sense. So um, again, I had to you know, figure out generally what I liked, what I didn't like. I wasn't 100% sure in terms of environmental science, but I figured I wanted to try. I knew that I liked it um, and wanted to go from there. It's basically <laughs> uh, me um, accepting the fact that I had an interest and was willing to explore that. So I would say that it really helped um, as I took more classes, I was able to find I did have an interest in that. I also wasn't stuck to one thing. Um, as Dara said, you can always do minors, concentrations, et cetera. I also found it really um, interesting to study urban planning and that's what I ended up minoring in along with geography and you know, internships, working, et cetera. All of that at the same time, I'd say my capstone was probably what led me to my current position today. Um, one of those courses was on smart cities um, and outside of the capstone, I also had a course on community development. 
But the Smart Cities course really inspired me because I learned about, you know, some of the great examples there are there, you know, across the country, across the world. And it's inspiring to see what cities are able to do. They're learning labs for climate action, where you can sometimes move items and pilot different ideas at a much faster rate than otherwise. Um, I think there's definitely a need for systematic change and, and global um, or institutional based changes, but um, really was fascinated by the facts that you could do so much at the local level. So after graduating, dabbled in a couple different things here and there, community health advocacy, but I always kept an eye out for government job postings. I was willing to work anywhere and everywhere. I really wanted to work in the local government field, especially. So this position popped up. I saw it almost as soon as it was posted, felt like the stars aligned. So I was able to apply, receive it, been here a couple of years now. And it's been a really amazing um, experience being able to both learn on the job, but seeing ideas and programs go from uh, start to finish, also working directly with our residents and engaging with um, volunteers, professionals from all different backgrounds doing this work, whether you're a lawyer, um, an engineer, um, a planner, and even outside of that, again, we have such incredible volunteers from all different backgrounds. So it's been really amazing being able to do this work. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, I definitely resonate with, I mean, a lot of majors hopefully um, registered to this. So we saw you have a whole spread and clearly there's lots of roles that need to be filled. So thank you for sharing. Um, okay, cool. We'll go to Elise. If you want to share, I'll just repeat it again. I know it's been a little bit. So why did you choose to go into the career relating to, to the environment? And then how did you get the position you are in right now? Sure. Yeah, so like like a lot of my uh, fellow panelists here, um, I went into school undecided into into UConn um, for probably all of high school. I thought I wanted to be an architect, um, but decided that UConn was kind of the best fit and UConn didn't have an architecture program. So I went in undecided and said, let's just try a bunch of things out and see what sticks. Um, so it wasn't until Soft, I think it was second semester sophomore year, um, right on the right on the cusp there of having to choose a major. Um, I took an environmental science class and I absolutely loved it. Um, I had had, you know, some experience and general love for as a lot of us have nature, the environment in general, but that really kind of was the tipping point for me. Um, but unlike Rose, I'm awful at math, um, <laughs> really bad. So uh, when I went to see my advisor, she was like, you might not want to do environmental science. How about natural resources? It's more science oriented than math. Um, so I was like, that's great, great fit. And I decided to, to focus in environmental conservation. That was my, um, my concentration. And that kind of allowed me to, to see a lot of different um, mediums, I guess, within, within natural resources. Because um, I was kind of open to doing anything uh, in the environmental or sustainability field when I graduated. So um, when I did graduate, it was 2009, which I think some of us will remember was terrible for finding a job. Um, I, I ended up working at Sikorsky Aircraft for a couple of years just because I it was a job, I needed a job. Um, and it was great experience generally, but was always keeping an eye out for something in the sustainability field. Um, ended up finding a job with a, a local um, residential solar PV installation company. So got into the clean energy field that way. Um, that was right in 2012, right around the time that the Green Bank, um, which was formerly the, um, which was formerly Cephia, um, had just launched a residential incentive program for um, for residents to go solar. So that's kind of how I learned about the Green Bank. Um, and working there, I realized that uh, while I liked to talk to homeowners about the benefits of going solar and uh, the benefits of having a, a more sustainable home. Um, when it came down to asking for money, I was not very good at that either. So uh, sales wasn't my strong point. Uh, education was great, the sales part not so much. So um, the Green Bank seemed like a really good opportunity for me at that time, um, more along the lines of policy and education um, and helping helping folks in the in the state. So. Took about two years to find an opening, um, but applied and uh, and got the job on the uh, 
commercial team, which is now morphed into the financing programs team um, at the Green Bank. Uh, and about four years in, I decided to go back to school. I did my master's in um, sustainable design. So kind of marry, marrying the sustainability aspect with the, my inherent love for design and architecture. Um, I did that through the University of Florida, um, an online program. Um, graduated from there in 2018 um, while I was still working full time, actually. It was an interesting year for sure. Um, and, and since then, um, just, you know, continuing to, to work with the, the different stakeholders that the Green Bank works with, but primarily with building owners and with contractors, again, educating them on the financing programs we have available, how it could help their business, how it could help their buildings be more comfortable. Um, I also am on the, uh, I'm part of the, the GC3, as uh, Lee mentioned, I'm on the land use working group, um, adaptation um, land use working group. Um, and I also just this year was elected to the board of directors for the Connecticut Green Building Council, which has been a really great experience working with a, a nonprofit organization focused on, on, you know, the built environment and sustainability here. So, um, yeah, I think that's. That's about it. Wow, thank you for sharing and congratulations. That's wonderful. Thanks. Um, cool. Okay, so last but not least, uh, Janine, if you'd like to go ahead. I am the, I am the youngest of five sisters. So last but not least has been my whole life. I take no offense whatsoever. Um, can you hear me? Am I off mute? That's perfect. Good, good. So I grew up, I was so lucky. I grew up right on the edge of a very large forest. And one of our hobbies was to just go out exploring. And it was in the, mostly in the seventies. And so kids were sort of allowed to go out and do their thing all day long, as long as they were back for, for dinner time. So that's where I found my first love of the environment. But I was not a fan of science until probably my junior year of high school. I had, in the same year, I had two amazing teachers. One taught ecology and the other taught chemistry. And they really showed me that science was interesting and I liked it. Um, I also, I am a lover of math. I adore math. And as it turned out, I had an affinity for chemistry and environmental science as well. So in 1982, when I had to choose what I was going to do for my adult life, I had two things. One was engineering and the other one was beauty school, um, which I kid you not was my second choice. And I thank my parents for sort of steering me in the direction of engineering. So that's how that happened. Fast forward at UConn, I was really, really lucky to land an internship. And you'll probably hear a lot of us talk about internships all night long because they're gold, especially now, I think today more than ever. But I had an internship with a PhD candidate in the engineering department and learned how to run a gas chromatograph. That led to a co-op inter internship with the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. While I was still at UConn, I did a semester of, of work study. That led to a full-time job at the same agency, which I, I stayed there for about three and a half years after I graduated. And that really paid the way to my now almost maybe more than 30 year career in consulting. So that's how I found my way here. Um, how, did I, how did I get my, my position that I'm in right now? Well, for the last 15-ish mm, years, I have split my time between running a corporation and continuing in my technical work. And somehow I accidentally ended up in business and running a business as a, a sideline to engineering. So I don't really know how that happened, except that for me, it was just a natural progression. And I love both. I love having the combination of being able to do what I love to do technically, and then um, run from the business and, and the people piece of it. Um, I will say that I, I never focused on money or success in my career. I was brought up to work hard and um, the, the hard work ethic was I think part of it. And then the other piece of it was just being completely passionate about the work that I do. And, and I really believe in what I do. And if you can go into a career where that's the case, um, I think you're gonna have a long and happy career. Uh, you're just all in, I think, when you're, when you're um, really in love with what you do. So I think success 
and career progression really take care of themselves if you're working hard and doing you know doing really what what you what you, what you like in terms of consulting i the people and the diversity for me has been key i love um the, the people i work with i love the people who are my clients i love the people who i lead so for me i think it's that combination that sort of got me to where i am now and um just a little earlier this year my company of uh, 27 years has merged with a global uh consultancy environmental consultancy company and so um i'm now transitioning from being a manager of a business based in the Northeast and expanding that throughout the entire US. So now for however many years longer in my career, I will get to do what I love throughout the entire country, which is pretty cool. And I now have staff in Alaska, which I can't wait to go visit them, which I have not been able to from the pandemic um, in California and Washington state in Arizona and Colorado and just everywhere and up from Maine um, in, in the entire Northeast. So that's how I landed here. Um, I, I think I changed from, from chemical engineering in my second year of college to civil engineering when I realized that's what I really wanted to do. But echoing what others have said, your path may not be straight, but you'll end up where you need to end up. Thank you so much. Yes, I think meandering paths is definitely a theme that that we hear as students and we need to hear more um, because it true, truly, if you follow your passion and work ethic, that's incredible. So now I'm going to toss over the baton to another intern, Noah, uh, for another question. And these rounds of questions will be a little bit shorter and we're going to take uh, two or three um, uh, panelists for each one. Thank you. Yeah, so for the next question, um... You know, whoever wants to answer, you can just hop on. But we're um, wondering, like, what's a defining challenge do you face in your industry or career? And uh, just a little bit about how you overcame it, went through it. I'll, I'll start because um, I, I this is sort of a really defining moment in my career. And I, I hope the young women out there will, will will relate to this. Or I hope you won't relate to this, actually. I really hope you won't relate to this. So I distinctly remember at 17 years old, sitting in my guidance counselor's office, it was 19, probably 81 at that, at that point. And my counselor telling me, or me telling him rather, that I wanted to be an engineer. And he looked at me and he said, you know, you might wanna go into something a little more on your level, like something like nursing or teaching. And nursing and teaching are awesome professions. Two of my sisters are nurses, two of my sisters are teachers, and they rock. But um, for me, that was just devastating. Um, I went home in tears to my parents and said, oh, he said I couldn't be an engineer. And God bless them. They said, you can do anything you want to do. And so thankfully for the well-being of, of small children and injured people everywhere, I chose engineering and not teaching or nursing because I believe I would have been horrible um, at both of them. Um, but the attitudes toward women in engineering were really, really different in the 1980s. I hope we hear tonight that um, this is not the case today, although I think we probably have a little more work to do. Um, I remember early in my career, one of my colleagues complaining because I got a promotion and he was older than me. And he said he had a wife at home and couldn't understand why I got this promotion over him, heard it, heard it third hand. Um, but you know, for me, how have I overcome that? In part, society has changed. Um, and in part, I just, I have this amazing role model in my dad, who is now 87 years old. And he really taught me to treat everybody with the same amount of respect, regardless of what their stature was in life and what yours was. And so I, for my whole career, I've walked into every meeting room, every boardroom, every situation where for many, many years, and still today, sometimes I am the only person in the in the room um, who is a woman, and I act like they are the most supportive people in my life. Um, they're like my dad, they're my partners, and I just refuse to see my gender as a barrier or a chip on my shoulder. I'm just me, I'm who I am, and um, I work with amazing men who have been champions for me throughout my entire career. So um, I think 
you know, when, when you don't see the barriers yourself, I think the people around you um, also don't see the barrier either after a while and we all forget. And um, to this day, I will be in like meeting, you know, an hour and a half into a meeting and I'm with 20 people in the room and then I go, oh, there's no other women in the room. Um, but it's, it's, it can it can be a barrier, but for me, it's it's also been a blessing because I've been able to bring in a really different perspective in a lot of situations um, that I've encountered. So, didn't have a very auspicious start, had a really nice ending. Well, that's good to hear. Um, does, does any other panelists want to uh, answer that? Uh, just to repeat the question, what's a defining challenge you faced and how did you overcome it? Yeah, I think I'd like to kind of piggyback off of off of um, Janine just said. I, I I I think in terms of a defining challenge, I think generally kind of feeling like you have the ability to do what you want to do, I think is a is a big challenge to overcome. I know you know starting with a solar company knowing just anecdotally what solar was and and having to become a sales rep for for a, a solar pv company was was scary and super challenging um but jumping in and and kind of taking taking on the challenge head first and just having building up your own confidence um i think is is definitely something to to do um you know it's great if you have you know, partners or or family or friends or someone to or, or coworkers that'll help you help you get there. Um, but at the end of the day, you always have to kind of be your own advocate, and you always have to push yourself to to do what what it is you want to do. Um, same thing, joining the green bank. It's it, we're the green bank, Connecticut Green Bank, financial institution. Really, I have no finance background. I didn't have any finance background other than the general education classes I took at UConn, which were very low level. And I probably forgot most of that by the time I got to the Green Bank. But, um, you know, jumping into it and and just knowing that you have to learn and listen and ask questions and and be able to, you know, talk to your your colleagues and um, and and just try to learn as much as you can and never be afraid to ask a question if you don't know the answer you you don't know the answer somebody else does and and someone else will help you so ask the questions um and just kind of you know get out there and put yourself out there a little bit and and i think i think in the end you'll be happy that you did because you'll you'll know something new and you'll also be one step closer to where you want to be That's great. Thank you. Um, so another intern at the office, uh, Marissa, is going to ask the next question. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Marisa. So. So a large part of climate change and environmental justice conversations includes advocacy and addressing systemic failures. How do you disseminate and address this in your professional work? Uh, this is Grace. I can uh, maybe start off. Of course, um, I think it's a really important thing to, of course, address those uh, questions and have a time for self reflection and awareness when you're considering these topics. Um, I think that as an office, we try to be as equitable and accessible possible when, you know, providing resources, um, doing outreach, et cetera. But we've learned it's always going to be an ongoing, um, ongoing process that there's uh, always more to be done. Um, for example, in terms of, you know, recent events, there's things such as, you know, the census um, participation, which is a huge part of providing um, funding and support for local towns, states, and um, regional areas, so it's hard to get the word out on that um, information if you are, you know, focused on one aspect versus another. While I don't work in that specifically, it's just a, a recent parallel. On our own end, you know, we started a project from scratch called Retain the Rain, 
Um, it's about rain barrels, trees, composters, et cetera. We essentially wanted to provide residents with grant funded materials so that they could save on whether it's water for their water bills and water conservation, energy costs when it relates to um, uh, shade trees or compost if they're doing their own gardening or lawn work. So um, we really wanted to make sure that these materials got out to um, our community. However, it was a challenge to meet people where they're at. And that did mean like going in person to multiple meetings, um, at the neighborhood level, going to volunteer boards and commissions, going to as many events and <laughs> presenting it um, as many um, activities as well. Taking that opportunity, even if that felt um, like it wasn't a direct connection to really make those connections and get our office name out there as well, because our office has been fairly new too. Um, so I think even we were, even though we were an office of two within one year, we managed to reach 1200 people and that's actually bumped up to over 2000 people if you include one of our partners that joined us on, on that work. So we've been really pushing out um, the word, but we know that that's still a drop in the bucket. So um, it's a good question to tackle. And I think it's one that would be interesting to hear other panelists and even um, in the later breakout sessions what students think as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'd love to hear if any other panelists would love to contribute. I can uh, take a crack as well. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about this question, you know, I um, I think about how how I've tried to position myself. Uh, I'm an engineer. I work in a consulting firm that does a lot of infrastructure work, a lot of um, we do a lot of work in climate uh, change and, and, and resiliency. Um, and when I think about the things that my company builds, bridges and, and communities and cities and stuff, I think about who they're impacting. Where are those, where are those, where is that infrastructure being built? Um, you know, where are the cleanup jobs that we're dealing with, mostly in impoverished areas? You know, thinking about who, whatever we're doing, who it's affecting. And I've also, so that's one piece of the thing that I think about. The other thing that I think about um, in my own personal career is understanding the societal and um, the people issues behind these things, learning. So one, one somebody had a question about, um, and I'll answer that. Um, I think I'll put it in the chat, but constantly trying to learn about um, the advocacy piece, the, 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 the effects, um, the choices that businesses make have on people, um, you know, all of that, I've been trying to learn about it while simultaneously positioning myself at a high enough level to use that information to make those decisions um, that benefit communities and stuff. And I think what's exciting about everyone who's joined this is that I think that that's a common, um, goal to help better society, the environment, whatever your piece is, you're helping something, right? Hopefully, hopefully. Um, and trying to make that a goal of getting in a position where you have some authority and not to sound like a crazy person, but have some power to change things, right? Um, one of the ways specifically um, that I've been trying to do that is to understand the, the language of business um, in consulting and engineering. You know, my background was mostly engineering and we didn't learn anything about business. Um, I could stay in science the rest of my career and that'd be what I do. Um, but I wanted to have more of an impact um, and you can have an impact in science and, and engineering and, and whatever that is in a technical sense. Um, but you can also have an impact with the, the people that you're working with or the clients or the companies in consulting that you're you're doing work for. Um, but you have to be able to to speak in that language, understand what their concerns are, and then have that that um, that that knowledge of um, impacts on community, sustainability in the social, environmental, economic sense to bring to the table to to push that and, and keep that in the forefront of the decisions that you you advocate for. So um, learning and then also getting positioning yourself, I would say, is, is kind of what I would uh, advise and what I've been trying to do myself. So 
hope that kind of answers the question which you had in mind. Yes, thank you. I think discussing positionality is so important and so multifaceted because you know there's talking about positionality and how something affects you, but also positionality of how what you learn uh, can be used for public benefit, and it's so valuable. So thank you for sharing that. Um, did we have any other panelists who wanted to contribute? If I could throw in some uh, sort of more general um, suggestions for things to do. I would, I would suggest these things. Um, educate yourself about racism and, the, and, and the, the role it plays in everything that goes on in our world. Invite others that you work with to educate themselves about racism. Invite people to respect women and people of color um, as they would like to be respected. And there are nicer and uh, less direct ways to do that and more direct ways to do that. Um, I would like to sort of invert, um, there's, a, there's a saying, nothing about us without us. And as a professional, inverting that into nothing about the, the people who live here without the people who live here. So those would be the things that I would ask everyone to keep in mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Those are all such valuable responses. And I think we have a lot to chat about on this topic. And I look forward to potentially doing that uh, once we move into our breakout session. So I'd love to ask another question before I turn it over to Noah. So let's check. So what is your dream job? Is this your current job? And if not, how is your current job putting you in the right position to get your dream job? Well, I'll speak because it's way not dangerous as one of the older panelists on here to talk about not having my dream job. Um, but I do have my dream job and I have, I think the first maybe six or seven years of my career were really learning experiences and I would not trade them for anything because they taught me a lot about not only what I wanted to do, but what I didn't want to do and the kind of company that I wanted to work for. Um, my second job out of college was with a very um, corrupt uh, company. People went to jail. It was really ugly and it, it taught me a lot about what was important to me in terms of the culture of the, the people that I work with. Um, but this is the really good news for everybody on, on our, our meeting tonight regardless of what your major is or what you specifically go into as your first job, it's a, an awesome career. I mean, I think that it's been a pleasant surprise every year of my career that I get to do new and different things. Um, but I have traveled places far and wide while I've lived in Connecticut. Um, I, I've been to places I would have never other ever been before. I've met really cool people, um, whether they were on a project or they were really impressive governors and senators and congressmen and world leaders in the in the work that I've done. Um, the projects that I've been able to touch have ranged from we removed a 1,200 foot long dam on the Penobscot River that restored this massive fishery resource to fish passage. Um, and and then completely flipped from that um, after Hurricane Irene, which wasn't so bad in Connecticut, but it was devastating in upstate New York. I get to be on the ground with the National Guard trying to figure out how to help people who were trapped, close bridges that were about to fall down and subsequently did fall down, um, working one-on-one -on -one with people who lost their homes, they had lost their businesses, um, some who had lost loved ones. Um, and, and we were able to get in there and make a difference, not just during that immediate aftermath, but for many decades to come in the, the river and, and stream restoration that we were able to do. Um, you know, I think probably the coolest thing about this profession is you can actually make a difference in real people's lives. Um, and while I've had the opportunity to go all over the world to do that, I have also never had to leave my home and my big extended family. So um, I'm, I am just feel really, really fortunate that I am in my dream job, but not only am I in it, I've been in it for an awful lot of years. Um, so if your first job out of school is an unmitigated disaster, 
it's probably a really good learning experience. And if the first two or three are, that's okay too, because it's all a learning curve to get to where you ultimately will want to be. And I think we all know it when we get there. So I, uh, I'm just really, really thankful that I am where I am. Beautiful. Thank you. I think that's very reassuring, especially as a as a junior and starting to think about all these things. Sometimes it's nerve wracking. Um, and I think that sometimes you put a lot of pressure on ourselves to kind of jump into the right position and stay there for the rest of your life. Um, which I think that it's 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 very reassuring to hear you talk about that, you know, and good things take time sometimes. So thank you. Um, we'd love to yeah. hear from yeah. someone else. Yeah, no, I definitely would like to to jump in on that question. So our our very organized panelists at, or organizers actually sent out these questions prior to the panel. So I knew that this question was coming and I have to be honest, it's a little bit of an anxiety inducing question. And I asked a few of my friends and I was like, how do you feel about this question? Like someone saying, like, are you in your dream job? And they're like, oh, that stresses me out. <laughs> um, but. So I think I kind of set myself up for success with that question because when I was going through college, um, it kind of stressed me out. Like I didn't know where I wanted to be. And I so I kind of said, you know what, as long as I'm in a job that I feel like I'm using my skills, as long as I like the people, as long as I feel like I'm making a difference and um, supporting positive change, especially as it relates to the environment and the climate, um, then I kind of was like, I think that that would be pretty great. So um, when I graduated, I had a really hard time finding a job and I had a terrible job um, before I got my current job. So I was going around, um, I had to talk to people who were about to get tons of trees cut on their property in order to have ample space for the transmission line so that the trees didn't fall on them. And then we have a huge outage um, across potentially the, the country. So um, yeah, I, I'd say that my job right now is my dream job, but um, that's not to say that there aren't many other jobs that could also be my dream job. Beautiful, thank you so much. I think that that's also very reassuring because you know sometimes we have so many interests that we don't know what exactly is the right path for us, um, but sometimes there isn't a right set clear path. There's so many options. Um, so thank you. Um, and I'd love to turn it back over to Noah now to ask another question. Yeah, so we'd like to know um, some of you guys touched on this a little, but uh, what's any general advice or something specific uh, when you were going out of college, something you'd like to let everyone else know? This is Lee. Well, for me, it was so long ago. I have to really think back. <laughs> I'm a college class of um, 81. Um, so um, when I was thinking back then about my first job, you know, my, my main focus was to get a job. So that was that was it. But over the years, as I worked in various nonprofits, uh, which is mainly what I did, I uh, I was kept focused on, you know, what can I learn from this job as I'm contributing? And the way I wound up at the job that I'm in now, where I've been for 15 years, is I was actually invited. Somebody who worked at the Community Foundation said, we. I think you should work for me and uh, I want you to come work here. And within three years, uh, that woman had left the foundation and I found myself uh, at the community foundation doing work uh, that I wanted to do, but seeing much greater potential uh, for what I could do. So I went to my boss and I said, this is what I want to do. And this is why I think it matters that the community foundation do this and that this is work in community organizing at the grassroots level with people, first of all, identifying and then supporting people who are creating change where they live. 
because we work with um, a relatively large number of people who basically are rich enough to give money and a substantial number of people who work in nonprofits who provide services. Um, and that's not to say that those two groups are totally exclusive. Sometimes you get affluent people actually running nonprofits. But when you combine all those people, maybe, I don't know, you have 10,000, 20,000, let's call it even 30,000 people in Greater New Haven. Well, 680,000 people live in Greater New Haven. What about the rest of them? What do they think? What role do they play in philanthropy? What, what role does philanthropy play in their lives? What changes uh, are, do we not know about? What opportunities do we not know about um, that, uh, that um, are, are the result of just who we're talking to? And that seemed interesting to the people that I work for. And that resulted in our going in a direction that has now opened us up, not only into uh, doing training in and supporting, uh, well, first educating ourselves, then doing training and supporting in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but also are working with small businesses, uh, mainly small businesses that are owned by, by uh, people of color and by women. And that is totally different than what the foundation was doing when I went there, and I'm not the president, and I'm not the CEO, I'm third, a third tier person. But this idea of leading from behind or leading from below by showing people not only what you're capable of, but what the opportunity is, what is the, the, the thing that can be the win-win, uh, that's really important, and you can do that at any job, at any time, if you stay focused and you understand how what you're doing impacts and is impacted by go, what goes on around you. So I say uh, pay attention, learn, but also know that you have something to offer and that's how you create the win-win. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, would anyone else like to answer that? Sure, I'd like to to chime in. I, I think the one thing I could say is just just don't panic when you graduate. Don't panic if you end up someplace that you don't think you want to be. Um, I think you've kind of heard all of us say say that. At, you know, myself, I ended up you know working for a technology giant instead of a you know aerospace industry giant instead of somewhere in the environmental field, um, and that's just what happened and it was a great experience. I met some great people. Uh, I learned about procurement. I mean, you know, learned about new things that maybe I wouldn't have learned about otherwise. Um, and it was a job to have in the meantime, you're always gonna have experiences there. You're always gonna learn something. Um, and maybe you're gonna learn that you hate what you're doing and that's okay. And you can find a new job to do, um, you know? So I think that's my, my biggest advice is, you know, regardless of, of what you end up doing, whether you're going into the job field or you're trying to find a job, going into the, you know, professional field, or if you're thinking about going to grad school or whatever the next step may be, um, you know, it's just understand that there's there's time to learn and there's time to uh, make adjustments. Um, you don't have to land where you're going to be for the rest of your life. Um, and you've got you've got time to learn, so definitely, definitely don't panic. <laughs> oh, thank you. So, um, for our next question, um, we with the time of COVID and it being a different time, uh, we're wondering, based on what you've experienced in the past spring and summer, um, what's something that you can expect to be an emerging concern in the next year as people leave college? during this pandemic time. I'll jump in with, with just a couple of quick thoughts. We've hired a number of people through the pandemic who are brand new graduates. So there are still jobs out there. Um, the biggest concern for us, and I think that we're probably not different from many other firms is it is, we are all working remotely. 
this is my son's old bedroom. I've um, been here for seven months. Um, it's really hard to bring someone on and mentor them when you're working remotely. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. Um, I worry about the economy and the, we call it COVID fatigue, where people are just, they've had it, they're done with it and their, their systems are stressed. And so our clients, I worry, it hasn't happened, knock on wood yet, that our clients will stop moving quite as quickly and they won't need us as much. Um, for nonprofits, I would imagine it would be the economy of funding um, because many of my clients get funding, which is how they, they hire us. So I do have concerns about the economy and um, less so, but I think this could be a perception. I don't personally have it, but I think there may be a perception um, that perhaps your college experience did not have the rigor that it ought to have because you've been remote for what will potentially, many people will potentially be a good full year and a half almost of, of remoteness if, if you're doing all online. Um, I see the amazing job that UConn is doing, so I really don't have concerns about that, but I, I wonder if that's going to become a thing um, to future employers. So the, the, the remote working is challenging. It's not impossible. And uh, for all of you who are going to be graduating very soon, I would just um, have patience. You'll get there. We will not be here forever. That's all my thank you. Wisdom. I don't have anything else. <laughs> Does anyone else want to jump in on it? Um, so I think just to jump in pretty briefly, I think um, Janine definitely covered the, the bulk of the topics. I would say though we, we have worked remotely with, you know, uh, interns and graduate fellows and it has been a challenge to kind of mesh that balance. And also um, I think the collaboration slash mentorship aspect has come up and while we've managed to make do, I think that that is a very a learning process for us as well as the students themselves. So um, I think being mindful of the fact that, you know, everyone's adapting to the situation at the same time. Um, the other aspect is, you know, people have been reaching out and trying to explore and see, I think networking has um, become more important than ever now <laughs> because um, it's a way of distinguishing yourself and also um, going back and seeing what other connections you um, have to explore out there. So I think, and also we we found that we've been recommending different um, different job posting sites, and we on our own hand um, had a virtual green jobs fair. We know there are jobs out there. I think even in the the first two or so months of the the outbreak, there was a company, a solar company, that had 16 to 32 new jobs. During that time, so that there's an outlook in the future. It's just a matter of right, being mindful, trying to find different opportunities, and um, right, a lot of networking. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So we'd like to thank you guys all for your responses. Now we're going to move into a quicker uh, question and answer session. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Caitlin, who's been monitoring the questions that have been asked throughout the uh, panel, and we'll just go into those. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Or hello again. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've been seeing some, we've been receiving some really, really interesting questions from the audience. Um, so this is, uh, this is a question from Victoria Zuko, or apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name, but um, so she's wondering what, you know, what day in the life of your job would be. Um, I know it's kind of a question that maybe could have been <laughs> answered earlier, but it also kind of along the lines, I'd like to elaborate and say, you know, is there is there parts of your job that you the day to day aspects that you really uh, appreciate that you might not have known when you were a college student? Yeah, I'll go right ahead. Um, so a typical day is pretty hectic right now. Um, I was recently promoted, so um, promotions do happen even during a pandemic, um, and I, a typical day for me is I'll have like a meeting on um, maybe on our conservation load management programs, which is our like huge 
um, energy efficiency program that's funded by a surcharge on your electric or natural gas bill. Um, but something that I really like about my days is I actually do a lot of design work for the agency. And um, funny thing is I, in my time when I didn't have a, when I couldn't find a position when I was looking right after grad school, I did some kind of like freelance marketing um, for my neighbor who was an artist and then another well, a friend of hers who was an architect. And I kind of like developed this like big interest in marketing and graphic design. And so one of my favorite parts of my day is when I get asked to kind of like um, ramp up a document or some kind of notice that we're sending out and make it more appealing and like design friendly and um, just more digestible for the public because that's such a big gap um, that I that I notice um, in my bureau and then uh, kind of like a, across the board in some like research focused uh, agencies is just kind of like the the gap between how they communicate versus how the general public communicates. So that's something that I enjoy doing a lot in my day to day. Yeah, thank you so much. I think and a question that we've kind of was already addressed by we had and was addressed by a bunch of panelists. Um, the transferable skills are huge, uh, especially in the environmental sector when you have to communicate with a whole bunch of stakeholders and the public and you know, it's there's complex issues, so I definitely appreciate that approach. Um, yes, yeah, simplicity is key. Yes, how I feel. <laughs> for sure. Uh, would anybody else uh, like to add on to that? Sure, I can uh, give a day in the life. Um, so a typical day for me uh, lately has been um, I've been working on a couple proposals uh, for energy clients. Um, so we have a couple of clients that are looking for help um, assessing whether they want to invest in renewable energy, specifically hydrogen, or um, they want to build solar plants um, that generate electricity for, you know, community or something like that. Um, uh, so that'll be coordinating with tons of different technical experts that do mechanical, that do electrical, and I know nothing about any of that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, it'll, my typical day is basically coordinating with a bunch of different types of technical experts, thinking about what our clients want and then helping them find a solution to do that. Um, this has actually been a change in role of mine. Um, one thing that I'm being paid to do right now is, is learn about new industries and then um, figure out ways that our company can help those industries grow and, and um, work with our services and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, I think uh, my day changes, I would say, not only on an hourly basis, but um, definitely on a week to week basis, but I do, um, I'll be working on 3 to 5 to 7 different projects within a day. Um, 1 of them is I work a lot with the city of Bridgeport, um, with a lot of their brownfield redevelopment projects. Um, so I do different types of stuff with, um, regulatory compliance and remediation. Um, uh, working with brownfields, and then I'll do stuff with energy and solar and renewable energy. Um. Another project, and I would say, I think those are the two groups that I'm working on this month. So it definitely changes, um, and that's what consulting is. I would say, um, working for a really big consulting firm means that you're working on a lot of different. You can work on. I think I just froze. Uh, you can work on a lot of different type of stuff at at a time. So, um, does that answer the question? Yes, it definitely did. Um, thank oh. you for sharing. <laughs> Sure. Um, and yes, you weren't frozen at all, so that's perfect. Okay. Right. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So now we're going to move to another question. Um, this one is from Julianne. Um, so Julianne, she's a first year marketing student, and she's very interested in environmental science and sustainability, and particular particularly as it um, in regards to how it's related to marketing and how can somebody get in career in marketing sustainable uh, sustainable options. So if anybody would like to speak on that. I mean, I'm happy to go. I know that my answer already kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, at least as it pertains to um, this Department of Energy Environmental Protection, I mean, 
marketing is kind of like a core piece of really any initiative and any change that you're trying to create. Um, because um, a lot of environmentalism and kind of like evolution and, and how we consume energy, how our homes heat themselves or like how we get our electricity requires a pretty decent amount of behavioral change um, and systems changing. And in order to kind of like influence people to change, you need to be able to market things appropriately to them and make sure that you're really communicating value to them in the right way. So, um, I mean, I will say when I started at the department, no one had ever done any kind of graphic design really. Um, and we created this report called the 20 by 20 report, which was all about, which isn't an area that I work on, but it was about improving how we do um, environmental permitting in 20 ways by 2020. And we created this whole brand behind it and created like this, this pretty report and um, it created so much more momentum behind the initiative just because it was kind of like designed to actually engage people rather than just being like yet another report that's a plain word text and no one's going to read. Um, so um, that's kind of how I feel about the the huge um, opportunity for for people who are have a knack at marketing in in the field. Thank you so much. That was perfect. Um, does anybody else want to add on to that? Yeah, jump in pretty quickly. Um, I definitely agree with everything that Rose said. I think there's right a huge market for marketing. You can utilize it in a lot of different formats and functions. Over at the city, we actually have there's a couple different ways in which we engage the community in terms of um, programs, initiatives, and whenever there's a new policy in place. Of course, you do want to get the word out to residents. We actually have an entire office dedicated to the office of uh, you know community engagement. So um, clearly, there's a need for communication, spreading information and awareness, um, and that's done through social media, in person, um, through call centers, etc. Um, personally, on our own end with the with our office of sustainability, um, like Rose says, every initiative you have, you we want to increase awareness, get people engaged plan for programs around the audiences themselves. Um, because we're an office of two, we have designed our own uh, materials a lot of the times, and it's, it's a bit of a challenge to do it on our own as well as everything else. But we have taken advantage of outside local businesses to you know, get the word out on campaigns and other materials. So I think that there's different aspects in terms of what you wanna do with marketing, whether you wanna do something more direct with people engaged one-to-one -one or something broader in terms of designing a campaign. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Julian, I hope that answered your question. Clearly, there's a lot of benefits to having that marketing experience and that understanding. Um, perfect, okay. So with that, we'll ask, we have a few minutes for some more questions, so. <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> my other document <laughs> is firing up. Uh, doo -doo. Okay, um, so we have this question from Alana. Um, she also, um, this is for uh, Elise, so she too, or Alana also wants to be an architect um, and she really wants to help the environment as well. So she was curious as uh, to whether you'd, you'd mind sharing more about sustainable design and if you ever looked back and wondered, uh, should I stuck with architecture or a more specific program to that? Um, yeah. Um... So I, I, I have definitely at, at different points um, during college when I graduated um, thought about, oh, I wonder what it would be to be like to be an architect right now and <laughs> um, instead or be taking architecture classes, certainly. Um, but I will say that it I, I'm really happy now. I mean, hindsight is always 2020, but I, I'm, I'm really happy now um, with the path I chose to do my undergrad um, in natural resources and kind of get that piece under my belt and have that be my foundation um, because that kind of helped help me get into the industry generally. Um, and then I was able to kind of take my time and find a master's program that I really, really, really loved. And the the program that I found with the University of Florida was was perfect in that sense for a lot of different reasons. One was it was 
all remote, which was which was a nice thing. Even pre COVID, it was a nice thing. Um, but I could do it full time. It was designed around working professionals, um, so it was you know meant to be a full time position while you still worked full time. Um, I can tell you, I had no other life than work and school during that year. But it was just you know twelve months, and I was able to kind of power through it. Um, but taking that time in between to work and kind of be in the industry, um, I think was super, super valuable for me personally to have that working knowledge of, um, of clean energy, I think, and then being able to take my knowledge of clean energy and clean energy finance and policy and put that into my focus when I was learning about sustainable design and community development and green buildings in general. Um, so I, I, I definitely am happy that I chose the path that I chose um, because now it kind of broadened my scope a little bit. Um, so it's not just clean energy and finance, you know, now it's, it's more of that, that love of architecture and, and green buildings and the built environment um, generally that I get to kind of think about and and the green building aspect of it kind of influences what I do at the green bank now every day. I mean, it just so happens I work with building owners as well. So that's helpful, um, but it definitely influences the way that I think and, you know, kind of the way that I think about the future and um, potential programs or different things that I would love to see the green bank get involved with um, at a later date. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a kind of a tough choice, I think. Um, but I but I am happy that I that I chose the path I did, and you know, it, it, there's always kind of continuing education to to if you're split between two different things, um, you can always wait and pursue another degree or pursue a master's degree or a certificate uh, in something else down the road. Um, yeah, I hope I kind of I kind of rambled there, but I hope I hope that helped. Helped. No, that was perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, so we have another question from Reese. Um, so this is an interesting one. Uh, so do any of your roles uh, or positions have to do with teaching others about global warming? Or um, so I guess another follow-up question is: What are the challenges you've run into um, in trying to, you know, express to people why global warming or environmental issues are issues? <laughs> I can start us off on that one. Um, so I, I am of the opinion that global warming is grossly misunderstood by a lot of people. I think those of us who deal with it on a regular basis, we understand the full depth of it and, and what it means. And it's not just, it's going to get a little warmer and I'll have my air conditioner on for more days than I did 10 years ago. Um, I think that we, the bigger we, don't do enough work to connect the dots for people to say, you know, crop disease and drought and hurricanes and wildfires and sickness and disease in people, all of these things, flooding, um, they are all related to climate change. And that doesn't even get into the ecosystem and the, uh, the, species that we're losing every single year. I just think it's kind of a big amorphous blob for a lot of people. Um, and so I think it's incumbent upon everybody in every walk of life to teach as many people as you can, probably more often informally than formally on what climate change is and what we as individuals can do about it and what we as a society can do about it. So um, interesting, one of the one of the questions a number of questions ago is what what do you like about your job that you didn't realize you would like when i was at uconn if you told me i had to get up in front of three people and present to them for five minutes i might have fainted that was the most horrifying thing i could ever imagine doing and if you told me that's what i had to do in my career i would have probably backed out and gone into something else um and now oddly enough one of the things that i really love to do is to teach people about what it is we do and to do it in a manner that is um, friendly to them, not by being 
really complicated and using a lot of terms of, of, of art or engineering, but just in just plain old simple language, explain to them what we do and why we do it. So we, um, and, and Tahira will, will, will probably relate to this, a lot of our projects go in front of the public. And it might be a public of 30 people in a room, and it might be a thousand people in an auditorium. Sometimes they're angry people. So that makes it a little twist of an interest. But a lot of the work that I've been involved with is talking to the public about flooding, whether it's inland flooding or coastal flooding or resiliency or things of that sort. And I find that the best thing that we can do is to just teach them in a very respectful way how all of these dots connect and why what we're, what we're proposing or what we're analyzing, what we're talking about, why is that important and how's it, how does it affect all of us? And so whether you are teaching as a teacher or teaching as a neighbor or teaching as a parent or a friend um, or as a consultant, in my case, I think it, it is really incumbent upon all of us to do as much of that as, as we can so that people get it. Because 20 years from now, if we don't collectively understand it and start doing something about it, it's, it's, it's a really frightening thing to me. So I think teaching is part of my job, even though I didn't become a teacher. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that answered the question. Definitely did. That was perfect, Janina. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I know we're. Okay. we're... Oh, I actually yes. just want to jump on that real quick. Oh, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, Janine. <laughs> to what you were saying. Um, gratefully, being in uh, the science community, I have not personally had to deal with people that did not believe in climate change. So, <laughs> I'm grateful for that. Um, but uh, but also, just so you're aware, I mean. Climate change has a very tangible effect on uh, communities, especially coastal communities. I mean, I know Maloney McBroom does a ton with coastal resiliency. And the fact that, you know, the Army Corps had to completely revise floodplain lines, you know, because of the recent uh, increase in storms and all of that. New York City is spending billions preparing for you know, mass flooding that's going to be happening over time and stuff like that. And that's directly linked to climate change. And we're, we're, we don't find ourselves having to fight these cities, convincing them they're spending the money because they know they're going to lose a ton of real estate down by, you know, lower, lower Manhattan. You know, a lot of these coastal communities are losing assets. Their assets are being, uh, are, are, are facing destruction. And we have to come in as consultants to help them think about how to, how to make uh, wastewater treatment plants and and whatever infrastructure they have on coastal lines more resilient to climate change and stuff like that. So it's definitely not a theoretical concept. It is a concept that requires money <laughs> and people to be proactive because it's happening now. Um, so I I think there's a definitely there's a difference between the general public versus um, people that are in business or consulting or that have to manage things or whatever it is. Um, there's hope as my message right now is that there's hope <laughs> because people get it. <laughs> so. That is a great message to end on. <laughs> um, thank you so much to hear and everybody for speaking all the panelists and the attendees for your amazing questions. Um, so insightful. So we appreciate it all. Um, we're going to wrap up uh, with our intern, Natalie. Uh, she has a few closing statements for us. All right, thank you so much for coming everyone and staying a couple extra minutes there. Um, we hope this event provided some answers and advice for yourselves as we all up and prepare to enter the professional world. We also hope that this can inspire us to pursue our passions and remind us that there are so many solutions oriented environmental careers. We are all part of this larger goal to combat climate change and work towards climate and environmental justice. Special shout out to the wonderful panelists. This event could not have happened without you. If the panelists would like to drop your emails or contact information in the chat, please feel free to do so now as well if you're comfortable. Thank you all for coming again and um, can continue these conversations in breakout rooms that I will explain in a second. Um, and you will also be getting a post event survey. So be sure to fill that out if you get the chance. Um, so now Mara just dropped in the chat three different breakout session rooms. So they're not breakout rooms as, they're, as they usually are on Zoom and WebEx. They're actually separate WebEx meetings. So you're going to have to click on that link to um, 
whichever room you're interested in, they're broken up into pairs. So there are three rooms, two panels per room. So take a look, um, copy and paste, message us in the chat if you're having issues. And panelists, you'll be doing the same thing. So just find your name and um, log in there. Um, but thanks again, everyone, so much. And we're excited for these to continue for a couple minutes, maybe, in these networking sessions. Thank you, everyone.